Appreciate that, brother. Appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. Certainly a blessing every time we're able to get together as Christians and study God's Word to try to learn something new from it, to glean from it. And it is a blessing to be able to be here with you. I'm honored to have the invitation and to be able to be here. We're going to be studying through and looking at James. And so, let's see if I can... There we go. See if I can get this to work. I'm going to wrestle with two controllers and uh, I'll do my best. So we're going to open our Bibles to James chapter 4. James is just such a practical, practical book. And, you know, not necessarily from the practical side that many times we think about. We think about, oh, you know, it's great. It tries to encourage us to do good. But also, when you look at the book, um, it chastises uh, those that are Christians for not living the way they need to be living. And frequently, it, it is very explicit and, and it contains within it a rebuke for those that claim to be Christians but live a life of hypocrisy. And over and over and over again, that's why it is so practical to us on a daily basis, each and every day, because of that very fact. And so what I want us to do is I want us to try to go through the chapter, chapter 4, but I want us to first start at the end and then we're going to come back to it. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at verse 14. Now in verse 14 it tells us, we don't know what tomorrow is going to hold. Our life is short. One day, it's true, we're young, and we think that our whole life is ahead of us, and we can't, you know, I just can't wait until I get into the, you know, middle school, high school. I can't wait till I can drive. I can't wait till I go to college. I can't wait till I get my first job. I can't wait till I have my first house. I can't wait till I have kids. I can't wait. And we spend our whole lives with, you know, I can't wait, and then all of a sudden we look back and think, where did our life go? <laughs> uh, wow. You know, uh, I can't wait to retire. And then when you're retired, you're like, oh, wow, well, am I already here? You know, and, and that's the way life is. It is a, it's like a vapor that's there for just a moment, and then it's gone. You can't get it back. You can't go back and do anything over again. It's already spent. When that vapor comes up, it's already there. You can't contain it anymore, and it's there for just a short amount of time. It's gone. And so we need to be careful especially in this context with our pride, with our boasting, with our arrogance, and our saying, this is what I'm going to do, and not even thinking about God's plan or His scheme or how that will impact our eternity. And ultimately, that's what he's getting at as you look at this passage. Well, what we really should say in verse 15 of James 4 is, well, if the Lord wills, this is what I'm going to do. And then he tells us our pride, self-confidence, our arrogance. It, the, the King James uses the word boastings. Our boastings are no good. We might be rejoicing in them, but they're not any good. Matter of fact, they're evil, he says. And then he says, now, you know, we know, of course, verse 17, the individuals that know what is good and what is right, and that we know what to do, but we choose not to do it, it is sin. Now, what I want us to do is I want to wrap back around I want to try to put that in its context because if you jump after it in chapter 5, which I know will be hit on tomorrow, you're going to see. I mean, it talks about riches and corruption and luxury and, and wantonness. And so in between that, which you see in chapter 5, and if we go back at the beginning of chapter 4, in between this principle of being careful with your life because it's short, is the idea of how you're going to live that one that God gave you. How are you living with the life that God has given you? Now, in chapter 4, we see two categories that are placed within this. We'll see if I can't get that to move. Did it stick? Well, I'm going to keep rolling and, and they can catch up with me. All right, so two basic categories we see. Verses 1 through 5 of James chapter 4, we have the pursuit of pleasure. And then James chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, we have the prescription 
and the cure that is laid out there. And so let's begin verses 1 through 5. If you look at verse 1, he says, from, from, where do these wars come from? From whence come wars and fightings or disputes or quarrels that are among you? Where do they come from? They come not hence, or uh, come they not hence, even of your lust. Or the word that is used here is also passions that war inside of you. So you've got these passions that are at war inside of you that are causing you to behave badly, that are causing you not to behave as Christians, but rather to behave as worldly individuals who are following Satan and not Christ. Now he's he's talking to those that are Christians. And so we need to be listening very carefully because it's one thing to say you're a Christian, it's a whole other thing to live it. And there are many people that live in hypocrisy that are claiming on one hand to be Christians, but when you examine how they treat others, how they behave, how they interact, the way that they live their life, they're living a life of hypocrisy. And they're not truly living it. Where does all this come from? Well, if you look at the word that is represented here for lust in in verse 1, we get uh, hedonon. Now, you might be uh, familiar with the word hedonism. And what that means, the idea of fulfilling all your passions, all your lust, all your desires, and just try to live your life, if you're practicing the philosophy of hedonism, that is just live and fulfill every pleasure, whether it's sinful, wrong, evil, or what, you just live that up. Some would say, soil your wild oats might go along with that idea, but that's, that's the idea of hedonism. It's a philosophy that pleasure is the highest good and proper aim of human life. And so it's sensual pleasure, physical appetite, pleasure that is made an end of itself. And so he says, what's happening here, if you go back the verses that precede this in chapter 3, he's talking about envy. He's talking about boasting, not having enough humility, verse 13. He talks about envy in verse 16 of chapter 3 and confusion, order, and evil. And then he flips that around and then he tells us that we ought to be living right in verse 17 of chapter 3 without partiality and without hypocrisy. Sincerity. Christian sincerity. And then he says, but that's not how it's happening. Because what he is seeing and what he is observing is individuals that are having these quarrels and disputes and are treating each other so awfully and harshly and bitterly and with anger and spite instead of with Christian love. And so when you see here that then where does it come from? It comes from our selfish wants. It comes from self. It comes from that desire that says, I'm going to do what I want to do and I'm going to please myself. Verse 2. Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. You fight and war. That is, that you dispute and fight, yet you have not because you ask not. So when you look at the first part in verse 2, ye lust, that is, that you covet or you long for, but really you don't have. All of these things you don't have, but then you, you have fightings and war and disputes. You don't have because... Well, you're not asking. And then if you ask, you're not doing it right. So either one hand, you don't ask. God is not your king and you're not serving Him and you're not just trying to submit yourself to His will. And in that scenario, you're the one that's king and your desires, your pleasures, and what you want is number one. And everything else just kind of comes under. But then in verse 3, he says, you ask and receive not because you ask it amiss. You ask it amiss, badly, evilly, or wrongly, that you may consume it or spend it upon your own pleasures, your own desires, your own lust. And so, what are you concerned with? I. You know when you saw that, when it was on the screen, it had the word pride, and in the middle of it was what? A big old I. And so, we'll see. It's still not up there. That's all right. Is, is an eye in the middle of pride. And so that's exactly what you see centered around this. At the beginning of the chapter, at the end of the chapter, and in the middle of it, you can see all of this. And so you go to verse 4 and he says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is 
enmity with God. What is that? It, well, it's, it's the King James word, but it means hostility. It means in opposition. So if we decide that we're going to be friends of the world, then we are in a hostile relationship. As a matter of fact, we're in opposition to God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is a enemy of God. And so you've got that hatred that is there. Why would he say adulterers or adulteresses? Why would he use that? Now this is going to seem harsh, but this is what he's saying. Sometimes you say, well, you know, in the Bible, there, everything is, is with a, a tender, soft glove, and there are never any glancing blows from the proclaimers of the message. But remember, the Holy Spirit is behind this, and James is writing, and he says, you know what? You're cheating on God. You're cheating on God. You claim to be faithful to God, but you're not. You're an adulterer. You're not remaining faithful unto God because of your behavior and how you're living your life. And so that's exactly what he lays out here in this text. You know, we can't have a foot on both sides of the fence. In the book of Revelation, it calls those individuals, they were in Laodicea, they were lukewarm, right? Not hot, not cold. They were just in the middle trying to straddle the fence. And we don't need to do that. In our relationship with God, we are going to give Him all or we're not. But what are we trying to do when we say, well, God, I'll give you this leg, but I'm going to let Satan have the other. You know? I'll tell you what, you can have my body and it'll show up and sit in the pew, but Satan's got my heart. You think about that, or Satan's got my mind. We have to be willing to give all to him. We cannot serve two masters according to Luke chapter 16 and verse 30. And so where is your allegiance where is your attention? Where are your affections set upon? Are they only on the pursuits of this world? Trying to get ahead, trying to get more, trying to live comfortably? Or do they have to do with the kingdom of God, saving souls, spreading the kingdom, and doing everything that you can in all of your life to glorify God in all that you do? So those are questions that we have to ask ourselves. Are we serving God or are we serving self? Are we serving the world? God's people are supposed to be faithful to Him. But according to James, many times they are not. And so, in this passage, he's not talking to the unsaved person because that person would not be in a relationship with God. He's talking to the one that is in a relationship with God and therefore can be called that because they're not, not, they're not being faithful. And so he's dealing with individuals that have obeyed the gospel. They are saved, but then they are not living as God would have them to live. And that's why I said James is practical. Oh, yes, it is. But many times we glance over it. We want to look at everybody else. We don't want to look in the mirror. But I'm telling you, if you go through this book and you look in the mirror, it preaches right back at us. And it challenges each and every one of us to, to live to the standard of the King. He set the bar high. We have to live that way. And so what we see here is spiritual adultery that is referenced in this text. So, worldliness frequently causes quarrels and conflicts in the church. When our heart beats to the rhythm of the world, then we become an enemy of God. We don't need to do that. We go to verse 5. Really interesting verse. Matter of fact, it's probably, <laughs> it's probably one of the most challenging verses if you really study it. Uh, you might pass over it really quick and not catch it. But this is an interesting verse. He says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? That is, it intensely craves possession. And so I'm, I'm going to read a couple of different translations. You know, we just read the King James. The American Standard says, Doth the spirit which, which He made to dwell in us long to envy? The New American Standard, New American Standard says, He jealously desires the Spirit which He has made to dwell in us. Um, some of these are more paraphrased or very loose translations. I don't recommend the NIV, but I do. I'm going to quote it just so you know what it says. He jealously longs for the Spirit He has caused to dwell in us. The NET says, The Spirit that God calls to live within us has an envious yearning. And the NRSV says, God yearns jealously for the Spirit that He had made to dwell in us. So if you, if you actually look at the different English translations, many of them say something completely different, and they have a different meaning. That's why I said this is a really uh, interesting verse. 
sometimes we would just fly past verses like this. I'm just going to throw out a few things, and I'm going to ask you, which one is it? And then we'll move on with our lesson. Is it that the human spirit given to, given to us when God created Adam envies intensely? Or is it that God's spirit within us is intensely jealous for our faithfulness? Or God is intensely jealous for us to honor Him by the Holy Spirit living in us? Or is it that God is intensely jealous for us to honor Him with our spirits. Because when you look at spirit, it may either be uppercase or lowercase. And so the context has to drive it. I'll leave you over that. That's for you. Go study it. Go dig into it. Because the preacher doesn't always have to tell you. The Bible says, study to show yourself approved. So let's dig in further. Here you go. Verse 6. As you're in this passage, again... He says, Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth the envy? Verse 6, He says, But He giveth more grace, wherein before He saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. When you think about this, you're going to see the the great contrast that's at the beginning. And, And you can call it bookends of this section of Scripture in which at the beginning it's talking about envy and lust and strife and wars and debates and division, and at the end it's talking about our boasting and our arrogance and our pride. And then in the middle of that, what do you got? Humility. Now there's a driving force that's behind it, of course, as you read through this. You've got pride that causes all of these problems that trips us up, and we know that you've got three basic categories. You've got the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and then what? Class? The pride of life. If there's only three categories our sins fall in, that last one's got to be pretty big, right? And he's dealing with that here. And so, if thinking about back about verse 5 regarding our faithfulness, adulterers cheat on God in favor of the world. And God is jealous for His people's faithfulness, just like a husband is for his wife's loyalty and faithfulness. You think about Hosea and Gomer and and the illustration that is there and the way that God desired for faithfulness from the people of God in the Old Testament. He desires that of us as well today. As His people, He desires for us to be faithful unto Him and to put away self, to take up our cross daily. That is, we've got to die first. That's what a cross is for, is death. We've got to die first and then take it up and follow Christ. That means He's going to come first now because we're dead. We put ourselves on the cross, we died to self, and now we're going to serve Him. And we're going to soldier on each and every day. That's going to be something we do every single day. God wants His bride, the church, to be faithful to Him and to Him alone. And so in verses 6-10, through you see the prescription and the cure. And in verse 6, you see that blessing of grace that is extended to an individual that is humble. In Proverbs 16 and verse 18, it says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now frequently we would like to say, okay, when we think about this verse, it's really easy for the body. Always think about people outside. Always think about those sinners. But the truth is, they're individuals that are not living as they should, even that are Christians, and that need to hear the blessing as well. And, 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 and as I'm studying through this, and as I've already preached to myself, and I get the chance to preach to you, I've had to preach this to myself. And look at my life and examine it and try to figure out what I am doing in my life. Am I truly humble? There are direct imperatives that are given, and they are given in the original language. And the force is driving it home. These are imperative commands that follow. What are those imperative commands? Submit. We've got to be willing to submit ourselves, therefore, unto God. That is, obey, if you actually look at the word that is used in verse 7. It is obedience. It is ultimate submission. And it's not a choice. There are a lot of people in the religious world today that don't don't like that that word, obey, or obedience. Submission is really no difference. That's exactly what he's saying here. And guess what? It's not a choice. You don't get to choose whether you're going to obey God or not. He says, you must obey. Obey me. You have to submit unto God. 
Where's the remedy for the, the problems that were existing here that James is trying to deal with within the brethren? And he says, number one, you've got to submit yourself to God. Sometimes we think, well, I've done that. But frequently we've allowed ourselves to still remain number one. We put God down there on, on pedestal three, four, five, and He sometimes gets shifted way down, and we put all kinds of other things in place of that. We say, oh, yeah, we've got God, but He is not all of who we are. It's not compartmentalized. This is not why well, I'm going to put God on Sunday or maybe even on a Wednesday. This is every single day. This is who I am. I'm a Christian. I know the kids used to sing that song and spell it out. I'm not going to try to sing that. I'm a C, I'm a C H, you know. They're spelling it. I'm a Christian. And that's not just not just the day. That's every single day. Every time I wake up, I'm a Christian. How am I going to live the day? Better live it for Christ. Submit yourself as an imperative command. Satan wants you to follow I, though. And he definitely would like the I in the middle of pride. He doesn't want you. You know, Satan doesn't want you to submit to God. He doesn't want that. The second imperative command in verse 7, resist, is imperative. And it is a command. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. 1 Peter chapter 5, 8 and 9 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. So what are we to do? We know the adversary is there. He wants us for lunch. He doesn't want us to go to heaven. And so we have to resist with all that we are. Another imperative command, verse 8. Draw nigh. That is a command. Submit. Resist. Draw nigh. Draw nigh unto God, and He will draw nigh unto you. It, it, it starts there. I think people today have it uh, uh, backwards, it's especially in the religious world. They feel, they feel like it's none of man, all of God, all of God, none of man. That is uh, the Protestantism, Reformed theology um, belief, or at least that system which says God does it all and you got to do it. Now, whether it's grace only, faith only, or any component of that, generally that's the foundation of it. But this passage says, by the way, you have a responsibility as man. And if you want God to draw near to you, you've got to draw nigh to Him. You have to go to Him. And that's what the Bible teaches. And, and by the way, this is not a choice. This is a command. Submit. Resist the devil. And draw nigh to God. And He'll draw nigh to you. And then we see the next section of this passage. In verse 8, Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. The idea is, uh, stop doing evil. You know, stop practicing evil. Purify your hearts. You know, we could put that in the category, maybe stop thinking evil. You double-minded, he says. Be afflicted or grieved and mourn and weep. Feel remorse for what you're doing, for how you're living. And then he says, let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. What is he saying? This isn't a trivial matter. As a matter of fact, it's not a joking matter at all. It's actually a very serious matter, and that's why he's bringing it out as he does. In the middle of this, he's saying, this is really serious. This has to do with your Christian walk. It has to do with how you live your life. It has to do with how you treat everybody. And sometimes we think, when we look at the two greatest commands that sum up all of the Old Testament law, which are what? Love God with every ounce of your being. Heart, soul, mind, strength, right? And then what's the second part of that? Well, frequently we, we think, well, I got the first one. We leave off the rest. Love your neighbor as yourself. Well, we don't. We, in practical speaking, we don't do that. We just, well, I got, I got God. You know, I don't have to have these other people. Well, he says here that you need to have that relationship. If we're truly living as we should, then we've got to be willing to do what's right. And we've got to be willing to treat others well. And you're going to see that in the next verse. But he shows this process whereby we can get right with God. And that's really important. That if we find ourselves in a situation where we've allowed ourselves, our pride to take over, he says, here's how you can get back right with God and, and, and restore that connection that you have with God. Stop doing evil. Stop thinking it. Feel remorse. 
and turn back to God. In order to do that, it's going to take a whole lot of humility. James chapter 4 and verse 10. He says you've got to humble yourself. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. He will be the one that will exalt you. That's not easy. Uh, pride is a curious thing. Pride will cause you to deceive yourself. Thinking you're always right. And you can never do anything wrong. And everybody else is the problem. And you're not. And that's hard. And so a lot of times it takes self-examination for us to, to figure out and to look at our own lives and to try to assess how we're living, how we're interacting with people in order for us to truly be humble. We have to humble ourselves before God. Sometimes we try to exalt ourselves. We want the prominence. We want the position. We want to, to feel like that we're doing good. And so we want that. We seek it. God says, no, if you will humbly submit and serve me, I will be the one that will exalt you. But if you try to exalt yourself, God will abase you. He will lower you. In James chapter 4, uh, verses 11 through 17 is this, the, the next section. And he deals with that interaction that I was speaking about, how we deal with each other. He says, speak not evil one of another brethren. And so this speaking evil of has to do with slander. Speak down in a hostile way, deriding way, mocking, defaming, backbiting, detracting the reputation of another with malice. You say, well, that doesn't happen. Our brethren don't do that. People are people. People are people. And Satan is always there. And even good people make mistakes and have to repent sometimes. Right? And so, this is what he's saying here. You know, it does happen. And how are we to carry ourselves? How are we to interact with each other? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. We're going to be in heaven for eternity, Lord willing, if we're faithful. If we can't get along here on earth, how do you think we're going to get along in heaven? It'll be a long time in eternity. You see, we're not going to be able to have a separate section for people that we don't like and we're on the other section. You know, it doesn't work that way. Uh-uh. I'm sorry. You won't enter the pearly gates if you've got that mindset. It, sorry. That's not the way heaven works. And so we have to make sure that we have the right attitude, the way that we interact with people, the way that the things that come out of our mouth. And really, you've dealt with that already in chapter 3. How you're using that tongue. How strong, how powerful it is that a little rudder can turn a huge ship. That big old Titanic was turned by a little bitty old rudder. Right? It was. The tongue can eat somebody up and ruin their life and tear up their reputation. It's sad. Now, I know you are aware of all these different trials, and I'm not going to try to get into all of the modern day things, but you know, sometimes people make accusations against people just because they want money, or maybe they, and they don't care if they destroy another person in the process of it. And they'll do whatever it takes, they'll lie. Is that a good thing or is that bad? Well, we know. You say, well, what if that was me? That was the one that was having my name drugged through the mud. How would that make me feel? Not good at all. So we keep on going here, he says, again, in this text, we don't want to speak that way. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art a not a doer of the law, but a judge. In verse 12, he says, there is one lawgiver. Who's that? The one that is able, that is, has the power to save and destroy. Who is that? Well, ultimately God, but we know that Jesus also will be the one that's going to judge us. Bring to, into account what we've done, every idle word, whether it's good or evil, every action. J uh, John chapter 12 and verse 48. It's going to judge us. And so He's the one that ultimately has that judgment seat. We don't need to try to put ourselves in that seat and claim to be equals with the great King of kings and Lord of lords. And then he says, well, before we move on, 
there are sometimes uh, individuals they they enjoy uh, building themselves up, but in order to do that, they will tear other people down just so that they look good. We ought not do that. Now, I know that happens a lot of times in the business world. People are just trying to climb the ladder and they're fine knocking you off to get over you. They'll knock you off a rung and you'll go flying all the way down to the bottom of the ladder and they'll just keep going up and not look back. That's the that's world. It's a dog-eat-dog dog world. But that's not the church. It's not the kingdom. That's not the body of Christ. I ought not act that way. And we shouldn't be trying to do that among each other in which we are going to tell, tear others down so that we can uh, build ourselves up God's Word is designed to be a mirror for every single one of us so that we can look into that perfect law of liberty and to see how God wants us to see ourselves in great need of forgiveness and mercy and love from God the true judge. We see ourselves in need of great humility before a great King and a great Lord. When we speak evil of others or judge unrighteous judgments, it is like we're telling God His law doesn't matter to us. If His laws matter, then we would not be breaking His law. And so we need to remember who we are. As we go each and every day, who are you? Who am I? And who do I represent? We remember who God is. And so when we do that, it helps us you know, to realize just how small we are. I, I frequently like to go outside and gaze up at the night sky. Look at all those stars, check out the planets if I can, and then realize just how small I am. And I may think I've got some big area of influence, and, and then I, I really try to pause, and then I realize God has created this, and, and I'm not even seeing hardly just a speck of His creation. And how far is that sun? How far is that moon from me? How far are those planets? And yet it's just a tiny part. How great is our God? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Arrogance and pride boasts. You know what? This is what I'm going to do. We, we will. This is... We've got a plan. This is how I'm going to do it. And this is what's going to happen. Humility says, you know what? If the Lord wills, then this is what I'm going to do. You know, sometimes we, we set out a plan or a course and this is what we're going to do and we don't even include the Lord in our plans. We haven't sat down to pray into Him, to ask for His guidance. To, we haven't even communicated with God. We certainly haven't opened up His Word to see if we can gain anything that might give us insight into our decision and our path and what we should do. And, and then what's happening is we're allowing ourselves to provide direction instead of direction that comes from God and His Word. We have to be willing to be humble in order to be servants of God. So when you look at, at James chapter 4, 13 through 16, next section, he says in verses 14 and 16, Whereas... Well, we'll start in verse 13. He says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city, we'll continue there for a year and buy and sell and get gain. So here's the big plan. This, this is what we're going to do. Today or tomorrow, so what we're going to do, we're going to set our own schedule. We're going to go into this city or that city. We're going to select our own path. We're going to spend a year there. And so we've placed our own limits. And then we're going to engage in business. We have arranged our own activities. And then we're going to make a profit. Right? We're going to predict our own outcome. And that's kind of the idea that is here. As you see this broken out. And then he says, Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't even know if you're going to get tomorrow. Oh, you've got big plans, do you? And you may spend all your time on today serving the world and materialism and worldliness and leave behind God, have no time for God, no time for prayer, no time for God to speak to you through His Word. You haven't opened His book. You haven't read it. You haven't studied it. You've not given Him any time. You've given it all to the world. And what's on tomorrow? You don't even know if you got tomorrow. You say, oh, tomorrow I'll do it. You don't even know. God didn't promise you that. There's no guarantee on tomorrow. 
If we live our whole life on tomorrow, then either we will pass away or the Lord will return and we'll get to eternity. And what are we going to do? Stand before God and say, well, I had plans tomorrow. Is He going to allow that? Is that going to be acceptable to God? It's not. So we have to look at our life. There is this hymn of self-reliance by William Ernest Henley. Invictus, it says, It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Now some people use that. They like that. Boy, that's the thing for my life. I'm taking charge of my life. I'm going to do something, right? There's nothing, to, you know, nothing wrong with wanting to try to go and work and to be successful as a Christian, but I am the master of my own fate. It should be if the Lord wills, I'll do this or not. Not, not that I am going to do this. Now I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 2, 9 and 10. Now we'll come back to our passage in James. Hebrews 2, 9 and 10. It says, but we see Jesus, Hebrews 2, 9 and 10, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that He by the grace of God should taste death for every man. For it became Him for whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Who is the captain of your salvation? Are you the captain of your life or is it the Heavenly Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, the Spirit? Is it the, the triune nature of the Godhead that is captain? You see, sometimes when we say, this is what I'm going to do, this is my plan, and this is how I'm going to do it, and we leave God out of it, then what are we really doing here? Who's really the captain of our life, of our choices, of our decisions, of our service? Verse 17. I'm gonna, I, I jumped a verse. Let me go back. <laughs> Let me go back. We're going back to James chapter 4. In verse 15, For that you ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord wills. Verse 16, But now you rejoice in your boastings. You see, that's the bookmarks on each end of this. Starts at the beginning. Where's all this coming from? I mean, what, why are y'all eating each other apart? And, and, and he says, It's because of these worldly pleasures, your own desires of self and me and I, that's causing all of these problems. And you need to get right. You've got to humble yourself. And you need to realize you're serving God. And if you do that, then the way you treat your brethren will be right. And he reminds them of how to do it. And then at the end of it, he says, and by the way, when you rejoice in your own boastings like I, I'm the one that has everything together and I'm going to control everything because I'm it, we have left God out of all things. And so if you look up the word boastings, ultimately you will see the word pride, self-confidence, arrogance, those things would be used as synonyms. He says all such rejoicing is evil when we put I above God. When we decide I'm going to be the captain of my salvation instead of God. Verse 17, he says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, the person that doesn't do it, it's sin. Now, I want you to understand, we use that verse frequently and rightfully so to explain sin in every category, but what is the context of that verse? When you look at the context of what comes after it, you look at the context of what comes before it, it has to do with how we're treating each other and how we submit to God. If we're really going to treat each other well and interact with each other, it directly impacts our relationship with God, and therefore we've got to humble ourselves before God in order to properly treat our brothers well. And when we know right and choose not to do it, brethren, that's sin. We need to repent. We find ourselves in that category. I think, I don't know, does that, does that give me a few minutes? It gives me four, three, four, three, two, okay. It gives me a few minutes. 
James is, is a challenging chapter. I mean, James chapter 4 is a challenging chapter. The whole book is challenging. Love the book. When you put it all in context, you go back to chapter 1. And you see somebody that's got two minds. Matter of fact, in James chapter 1 and verse 8, you've got a double-minded man. That person's unstable. You ever know anybody double-minded? Matter of fact, if you break down the word that is used in the original, it's di-psychos, which means two psychos. You know, you got, <laughs> you got a person that's unstable. That's why he says it's unstable. And so, as a Christian, you need to trust God and have faith in God and live for God. And for a person to say, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, I love God and I serve Him, but not do it, not trust in Him, not rely upon Him, and not truly serve Him, that's an unstable person. Be careful. And so you see that as he talks about this and he talks about some of the trials that can uh, make us better. But then as you continue on, he tells us in James chapter 1 and verse 12, blessed is the man that perseveres. A person that will keep on keeping on, realizing God's not the one that pushes these trials in front of you. Satan is the one that is tempting you. It's not God. And when difficulties come, don't blame God. Realize those things come from Satan. And brethren, persevere. Don't give up. As he continues on down through this, at the end of this, or toward the end of this chapter, he reminds us about, again, in verse 25, a person who looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, him being not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. So if we're looking at chapter 4, how do we apply that throughout the book? Don't just say you're a Christian. Start waking up every day, looking in the mirror and saying, I am to be an image bearer of my Savior Jesus Christ. So today, as I have interactions with people, I'm going to remind myself of that. When my, my temper is tested and I'm agitated, I'm frustrated, I'm an image bearer of Christ. When people treat me poorly or they insult me, I'm an image bearer of Christ. How am I going to respond? When I want to lash out, how am I going to respond? When I want to use words I shouldn't use, how am I going to respond? I'm an image bearer of Christ. Don't just say it, do it. Live it. And then he says, watch your tongue. It's no good to just claim to be religious and sit in a pew every day. And then, yeah, I don't know, maybe you've ever met people like that in your life that uh, sat in a pew and felt, boy, they they ticked the box and then they go back during the week and maybe they worked somewhere and they did not control their time. What kind of the image does that place upon the church? What about those people that they work with that are not New Testament Christians, that are not Christians at all, matter of fact, and then they see that person saying, oh yeah, I'll go to church, and that's where they are. They're sitting in the pew, but they're not living it. Be consistent. And work very hard for that self-control that the book continuously reminds us of. And then he says, by the way, don't have partiality. Don't have partiality. Hmm. Chapter 2. Partiality. How many times I've seen people walk in and they don't have good clothes like I do and they were treated poorly. Congregations all over our brotherhood that do it. You know, they won't go out and convert people in poor neighborhoods because they're not going to put money on the plate. And of course, hey, you guys don't have your numbers on the board, so I can't put the numbers on the board. But most congregations have it plastered up there so that then you know. But they want that to go up. And so they don't want... Uh, People in the pews that are going to cause a benevolent burden, they just want you to go out and convert rich people so they can get more money. Don't have partiality. Live your Christian life as you know you should. And then in chapter 3, be careful with how you use that tongue. Chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18 as we close. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure and peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Thank you so much. I believe that's our time. Thank you so much for your kind attention this evening. Hopefully it's been beneficial to you. It has been beneficial to me.